any crystals are pretty, right? Well, they're also pretty fragile because they're basically like half water. Unlike the strong crystals like diamond, in a protein crystal, you have really um, weak contacts holding together the, just like attractions holding together the different protein molecules. And you have so much water going through them that these crystals are actually really, really fragile. Um, they can break up if you even just like touch them sometimes. And when we freeze them, um, we need to use like cryoprotectants to make sure that the water doesn't form crystals inside of our protein crystals, which would crack our protein crystals. Um, and so there's um, some cool stuff going on in a protein crystal. And today I just wanted to do a quick little note, like a really, really quick post. Um, yeah. So we have this Hampton Research poster on our break room wall. So Hampton Research tells like a bunch of the crystallography stuff. Um, and so you can see there's like a bunch of different forms of crystals. Um, so most of these they're showing are protein crystals, but there's also some other types of crystals. Um, and you can see that they have a wide range of sizes and shapes. Um, and sometimes they're really deceptively pretty and that the prettiest ones don't always give you um, nice diffraction data. So uh, we're trying to get with extra crystallography when we're trying to figure out a structure and sometimes the really ugly ones give you great data. Um, so don't be fooled, de deceived. But you can also see that there's a bunch of like other things that can form like salt crystals, which you don't want. Uh, precipitate, so this is kind of where the, where the protein just like gunks up instead of crystallizing. Um, and you don't want to see this. It's a lot easier to get one of these gunky precipitates than it is to get a crystal. Why? Well, let's discuss what is a crystal first. Basically, a crystal is a solid where everything is aligned in like an orderly lattice, um, which is basically it's kind of like a brick wall in that it has symmetry and it has like these unique smallest parts. Um, and everything's kind of connected the same way. So if you know like one where one piece is over here, you know where the identical copy of that piece is somewhere else in space, just by using a set of like geometrical conversions, like move this far this way, like up this way, twist this way, that sort of thing. When we talk about like um, diamond, this is like an allotropic carbon. So basically this is a covalent crystal. Um, and so all of these bonds are these like strong covalent bonds, as opposed to just like the attraction bonds that we have between our proteins in a crystal, um, a protein crystal. Those are basically like partial charge, partial charge attractions. Um, whereas with these, these are actually like strong bonds, like the bonds that are holding together the actual proteins. Um, but, and they have this, like each carbon is going to have four bonds to other carbons. And this is gonna make it like super strong. But when we have a protein, basically what we just have are some like sparse linkages between the proteins. So the estimates range from like 30 to 80%. Um, but so you can think of about like half of a protein crystal is actually going to be your solvent. So like your water with the various salts and pH stabilizers and all of that stuff running through the individual proteins and then also around the various proteins. And so sometimes you can actually have like a big gaps in between the various proteins. Sometimes you have smaller pack gaps. This comes down to thing we call like crystal packing. Um, and sometimes this can actually produce like artifacts and stuff, but I'm not going to get into that here. Um, but the, basically you have just like very sparse linkages through um, that are connecting your proteins together, unlike something like diamond where you have these really strong linkages um, holding everything together. And so your protein crystals are going to be a lot weaker. So even though they look kind of like these pretty diamonds, um, we have to be really careful when working with them. Um, and so when we're trying to get them to grow, um, we are very careful. Like we don't want to overhandle the trays. Um, we're in this drop, so it's where we're trying to get the proteins to crystallize. So we have like a mixture with our protein and some like precipitants um, that are going to help kind of get the water to get the protein to give up some of its water water bonds. Um, and form protein-protein bonds. Um, and we have to do this in this controlled way so that they, they don't just form too many protein-protein um, bonds in this like uncontrolled way, which is aggregation. So basically in a solid, the molecules don't have enough energy to like break, to um, overcome their, their attractions to other molecules. And so they're kind of like stuck in place. Um, but they can be stuck in place in an orderly way. Um, which is called a crystal or an unorderly way, um, such as an aggregate. And so we don't want them to aggregate.
but we also don't want the water to crystallize inside of our protein crystallize when we freeze our proteins. And so we need to freeze our proteins because we want to do, we're typically using like X-ray crystallography is why we're trying to get these protein crystals. And so in this technique, we shoot these highly energetic X-rays at the protein. Um, the protein, um, the molecules are going to scatter the X-rays and they, uh, the scattered X-rays interact, produce this diffraction pattern of spots. And then we work backwards from the spots to um, figure out the protein structure. Um, and so I talked a lot more about this in yesterday's post and other posts um, that you can look at if you are interested in learning more about extra crystallography. But the key point is that we're shooting these really, really energetic X-rays at them. And we, we need to, we don't want to just like fry our proteins. And so we need to freeze them. We need to cry over text them. Um, and so we need to get them really, really, really cold. But we need to get them really, really, really cold without allowing the water to actually freeze into crystals within them. Um, and so we can do this in different ways. So basically, in order to crystallize, it needs to form this orderly lattice. Um, and so where everything's kind of lined up. And this is like favorable because the water is going to freeze in this way that's going to fulfill all of its desires for like hydrogen bonding. Um, so like the partial charge attractions between the oxygens and the hydrogens and that sort of thing that you get with water. Um, but this take this coordination takes time. Um, and so if we freeze really, really quickly, we can avoid this. And so we can use, um, we can prevent the crystallization by getting it to, um, by like freezing it really quickly using like liquid nitrogen, um, then also making it harder for the waters to find each other um, by adding things like, um, cryoprotectants, um, like things like glycerol or ethylene glycol or propylene glycol. Um, and so basically these are going to kind of get in into like um, break up the water water networks um, by kind of forming, these are also able to form like hydrogen bonds and stuff with the water. So they kind of break up those strong water water networks. Um, and then we could also make the water like like each other less, changing the pH salts, et cetera, but we don't really want to change too many things when we're um, freezing our crystal. And so typically what we do is we have like a buffer that's basically the same as what the, it's already in, but we add like ethylene glycol or something like that um, to try to, um, to, try to um, prevent the water from crystallizing inside of our protein crystal and damaging our protein crystal. Um, but sometimes it takes some um, like optimization and trying out different things in order to find a cryoprotectant that works best. But if you're a crystallographer, you're used to a lot of optimization and trial and error and various things to try to find the right conditions to get your proteins to crystallize in the first place. And then once you get these really, really pretty crystals, you're hoping that they actually diffract nicely. Um, and so they give good data that you can work with um, and more on crystallography and how you work with the data in another post. And now it's back to work for me.